The Nine Lives of Ski Mask Life One Death Room Chapter One Ski Mask The loud crack of a shot glass slamming against the bar startles the bartender. He turns to see Grady Saunders, a heavily muscled man in his early thirties, glaring at him. Give me another one. The bartender picks up a bottle of Maker's Mark bourbon and pours Grady another shot. The bluish hue from the TV screen reflects off of Grady's bald head as he swallows down the shot and wipes the excess bourbon off his chin-strap beard. He slams the shot glass on the bar again. Another. The bartender gazes down at the empty shot glass and takes a moment to contemplate whether to pour another drink for the obviously inebriated man. Grady taps the shot glass on the bar, indicating that the bartender is taking too long to pour. Reluctantly, the bartender fills another shot, which Grady immediately wolfs down. He bangs the shot glass on the bar again. Another. The bartender takes notice of the serpent tattoo that winds from Grady's wrist to his bodybuilder bicep. He doesn't want to mess with this guy, but he needs to cut him off. If he thought one more shot would appease him, he'd oblige, but he knows Grady's type. This isn't going to end well. The bartender clears his throat before speaking. <clears throat> uh, don't you think you've had enough, buddy? Grady stares at the bartender with sinister intent moves his face closer, and hisses. I'm going to pretend like I didn't hear that. Now pour me another. The bartender looks around the crowded bar for one of the bouncers. He makes eye contact with the doorman, a portly man in his 20s, and gives him a nod. The thick bouncer quickly makes his way through the throng of people to the bar. Grady looks him up and down. You want something, Slim? The bartender speaks up. I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Grady doesn't take his eyes off the bouncer as he speaks. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to take this bouncer's head off and shove it up his ass. By now, two other bouncers have noticed the confrontation and strategically flank Grady. He detects this and smirks. Three on one. I still like my odds. With three bouncers surrounding Grady, the bartender speaks more confidently. Listen, buddy, you either leave right now, or I'm just going to call the cops. Grady redirects his glare to the bartender, who swallows nervously, quickly dials a number on his cell phone, and puts it to his ear. Hello, police. This is the Tap Room Tavern. We might have a situation here. Grady smiles and then steps closer to the bartender. His tone is convincing. I'll see you again. Soon. Grady turns and makes a point to bump his shoulder into the nearest bouncer as he walks to the exit door and departs. He is greeted by a cool blast of air as the tavern door shuts behind him. He scans the quiet street and sees that the area is void of people at the moment, with the exception of a hooker in a blonde wig standing further down the block under a street light. He takes a pack of cigarettes out of his back pocket, flips a cigarette into his mouth, and attempts to light it, but another gust of wind makes the task difficult. Frustrated, he looks around for an area that may shield the wind and notices a small alleyway. He approaches the alley and peers down it. It's a short alley, about 50 feet, that empties into a brightly lit parking lot. It's relatively barren, save for two small dumpsters. Grady ducks into the alleyway for a blockade against the wind, successfully lights his cigarette, and looks up as he exhales. He's surprised to see a figure standing at the other end of the alley. The bright light behind the man makes details difficult to decipher. He squints, trying to gain a better perspective of the mystery silhouette, and takes another drag off his cigarette. The figure offers no movement. It stands silently. Could there be something behind him that may have the figure's attention? Grady looks back. Nothing. He focuses on the figure and addresses it. You got a problem? The figure doesn't respond. 
You're about to if you don't shove off. The figure doesn't budge. Okay, asshole. He flicks his cigarette to the ground. Shall we dance? Grady takes five aggressive steps toward the figure and then stops in his tracks. The figure has finally moved, but not in the way Grady was expecting. As Grady motored forward, so did the figure, completely mirroring Grady's movement. And now, as Grady stands still, so does the figure. Grady takes in a breath. For the first time tonight, he feels a sense of uneasiness. He takes two slow steps toward the figure. The figure continues to mirror him, taking two steps forward as well. I'll give you one last chance. Turn around and get the hell out of here or I'm going to stomp your ass into the ground. The figure responds by advancing towards Grady at a deliberate pace. The figure moves through a splash of moonlight, finally allowing Grady to catch a glimpse of his adversary. It's a tall, broad-shouldered man wearing dark pants, a long blue-gray shirt, and a black ski mask. It's the glint of the eyes that give Grady the most pause. There's a ferocity behind them that he's never seen before. For a fleeting second, Grady considers the option to turn and run, but pride gets the better of him and he decides to rush the ski-masked figure. He lets out a battle cry and swings forcefully once he reaches his foe. Ski Mask easily dodges the wild blow, reaches down, takes a firm hold of Grady's genitalia, and squeezes. Grady lets out a high-pitched howl that he didn't realize was within him. Ski Mask kicks the back of Grady's leg, dropping him to his knees while switching his grip to an arm bar. Ski Mask twists Grady's arm even more than necessary, causing Grady's pitch to reach a level that would make Pavarotti proud. I heard you were a tough guy. Ski Mask twists Grady's arm even more, transforming his scream into a helpless cry. Oh, please no. Please no? That doesn't sound like something a tough guy would say. Ski Mask twists more and the bones in Grady's arm teeter on the edge of cracking. Oh, oh no, please stop, please. What's your ex-wife's name? My ex-wife? Ski Mask twists Grady's arm to the absolute maximum he can without it breaking. Ah! If you answer one more of my questions with a question, I'll snap your arm. Now I'll ask you again. What's your ex-wife's name? <coughs> Tina. Tina! Well, we have us a winner. That's right. Is it true that you like to beat up Tina? Don't lie to me. Grady answers quickly. Yes, 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 sometimes I do, yes. Grady sobs as Ski Mask talks. You're never going to hit her again. As a matter of fact, you're never going to see her again. I hear Mexico is nice this time of the year. You're going to move there. You're going to stay there. If Tina ever sees you again, she'll tell me. And I'll find you. Am I clear? Yes. Yes, Mexico. I I'll, I'll go to Mexico. I, I promise. I'll leave tonight. I, I, I swear. Ski Mask pulls a pair of pruners out of his pocket and places Grady's little finger between the razor-sharp blades. You're damn right you will. And this is just a little something to make sure you never forget who's waiting for you if you come back. Ski Mask squeezes the pruner handles. Grady's finger drops to the cold alley ground and rolls within his vision. Oh, my finger! Oh, God, no! Ski Mask lets go of Grady's arm and kicks him to the ground. It's just a pinky. If I weren't such a nice guy, it would have been your thumb. Hell, I think I deserve a thank you! The sobbing Grady doesn't hesitate. <laughs> thank you! Thank you! Grady lies on his stomach and blubbers like a baby. Ski Mask looks down at him in disgust and utters one parting word before exiting the alley. Pussy. Chapter 2 The Dog Ski Mask casually tosses his mask back and forth from hand to hand as he enters the large, time-worn brick building in the historic district of Paducah, Kentucky. A sharp ray of light emanates from a slightly ajar door at the end of the tiled hallway. 
Jones P.I. is stenciled plainly on the center of the door. Ski Mask pushes it open, exposing himself to the scent of hot, spiced beef. Tamale Jones, a mildly plump man in his 50s, with a pencil mustache and wearing a light gray fedora, looks up from his desk. He is holding a fork and appears to have just begun eating the steaming tamale sitting on the plate in front of him. This is a very common sight upon entering the office of Tamale Jones. Is it done? Ski Mask nods. Where is he shipping off to? Mexico. Tamale snickers as he sets his fork down, picks up a cordless phone from his desk, and dials a number. Mrs. Saunders? Yeah, your ex-husband's never gonna fuss with you again. As a matter of fact, you can bet the rent that you'll never see or hear from that sorry sap ever again. Yeah, you're mighty welcome. Enjoy your life. He hangs up the phone, reaches into his desk, and pulls out a manila envelope full of cash. He tosses it onto the edge of his desk. Ski Mask walks to the desk and picks it up. Rather than look inside, he just holds the empty envelope long enough to monitor the weight. Once deeming the weight acceptable, he turns and exits the room, closing the door behind him. Tamale eyes the closed door for a moment and faintly shakes his head. That is one creepy fella. Ski Mask steps out of the building back into the crisp air of the night. He begins to walk down the sidewalk, but something in the middle of the street catches his eye. A dog. A small, tan, short-haired dachshund. The dog is standing in the middle of the one-way street with his back to traffic. He watches the dog, expecting him to hurry off of the road, but instead the dog sits down and gets comfortable. Ski Mask's head spins in the direction of a revving engine and sees the bouncing headlights of a car moving way too fast for this road, heading straight for the little dog. Ski Mask looks back at the dachshund and whistles sharply. The little dog turns his head, looks at Ski Mask, and begins wagging his tail. Come here, boy! Ski Mask bends down, hoping a less intimidating stance will entice the dog to scurry his way. Instead, the dog simply wags his tail faster. Come on, boy, come here! The dog's thin tail beats faster against the blacktop, and he pants, making him seem even happier, completely oblivious to the metal death machine roaring his way. Ski Mask jets his head in the direction of the rapidly approaching car. He can smell its exhaust as he looks back at the poor, helpless dog that is now illuminated by the headlights of the vehicle. The headlights continue to brighten on the dog as the car thunders toward him. Get out of there, dog! Get! The dog's happy trance on Ski Mask is finally broken by the mechanical rumble of annihilation upon him. He turns his long, thin snout toward his appending doom and is frozen by fear as the car races forward. His worried eyes widen as the lights illuminate everything and the death machine finally reaches him. No! Ski Mask bolts into the road just as the car arrives, causing the dachshund to flee out of harm's way. The tires screech, but the car doesn't slow in time to keep Ski Mask from absorbing the full impact. He flies onto the hood, smashes the windshield, and then thuds onto the hard asphalt. Ski Mask can smell the lingering stench of burnt rubber in the air. He slowly opens his eyes to be greeted by the sniffing snout of the dachshund, who graduates from sniffing Ski Mask to licking him. Ski Mask can hear a car door shut and someone saying shit over and over again. The voice gets closer until he sees the long face of a man in his mid-fifties with wild hair. This has to be the asshole who hit me. Oh, how Ski Mask would love to gut this bastard like a fish. But he can't move, and things are getting foggy. Dark. He feels a sense of drifting away as his vision fades to black. Chapter 3 Death Room Pitch Black Ski Mask doesn't know where he is, but he's somewhere. He looks to his left. Nothing. He looks to his right. He can see a tiny square of light that is gradually increasing in size. 
As the square grows, the light brightens, and Schemas can finally make out his surroundings. He's in a room. A cold, desolate room with smooth, plain walls lined with metal rails. Cool air emanates from the stainless steel-looking floor. The ceiling is black, almost as if there is no ceiling at all, but rather never-ending darkness. As the light to his right increases, he can make out that he is lying on a gurney. He tries to sit up but is unable to. He feels strapped down, but can see no restraints. The development of the light square intensifies until the end of the hallway to his right has become the light itself. There's something soothing about the light. It seems as if it's beckoning to him. He becomes draped with the sense that all will be right when he submits to the light. Ski Mask is startled by a rumble beneath him. He looks down to see the floor slanting toward the light. He looks to his left to see the floor rising. It's as if he's in the middle of a giant teeter-totter. The wheels on the gurney begin to squeak as the floor tilts more and the gurney slowly rolls toward the light. Ski Mask fights the tempting urge of the light and reaches out, finally grabbing the rail on the wall, momentarily halting the gurney. But the tipping of the floor intensifies. Ski Mask's hand starts to slide and he grips tighter, holding himself in place as the floor continues to slope steeper. He reaches out with his other hand and locks onto the rail like a vice as the gurney slides out from under him and rapidly disappears into the light. The floor is now a giant metal slide. Ski Mask tries with all of his might to hang on, but his grasp loosens and he starts to slide down the rail. He clamps down firmer to slow his slide, but it is increasingly difficult to hold on. His hands are becoming numb and he can no longer determine how tight he is clinging to the rail. His grip is faltering and he has merely one or two seconds before his hands give out, causing him to drop and be engulfed by the light. Without warning, the floor levels out and all is silent. Ski Mask lets go of the rail and falls back onto the cold steel floor, exhausted. He gasps several times before his breathing finally normalizes. He feels beads of sweat dripping down his face. His instinct is to wipe them away, but he has no strength. Ski Mask takes slow, deep breaths and looks up into the darkness before his tired eyelids close and he drifts off. Chapter 4 The Monster Ski Mask is a monster. Make no mistake about it. That is exactly what he is. A ravenous beast with a voracious appetite for killing. He is what nightmares are made of. Psychologists would be dumbfounded if they ever got Ski Mask onto their couch. A prolific slayer that doesn't fit the typical profile one would expect when dealing with a serial killer. There is a list of traits that many serial killers have in common. Psychological and or sexual abuse as children. Bedwetting past the age of 12. Family history of mental disorders. Solitary behavior. Cruelty to animals. Arson. Sexual deviance. Substance abuse, voyeurism. None of these apply to Ski Mask. Psychological and or sexual abuse as children. As children, many serial killers are humiliated, neglected, physically harmed, and emotionally scarred. This abuse often leads to an inability to be academically successful, form healthy relationships with others, or to function normally in society. Ski Mask's mother and father were good people. He was an only child that they raised with love and care. Not too strict, not too lenient, very fair. 
He was intelligently astute from a young age. He picked up everything fast, including problem-solving abilities, cognitive skills, creativity, and social and emotional growth. Toilet training as well, thus bedwetting was never an issue. All the basics would be checked off as exceptional at best and normal at worst. Academically, he excelled, finding all of his subjects to be relatively easy for him. He loved his parents and had the utmost respect for them. His father was a well-respected butcher. His mother was a speech therapist. Neither had any clue that their son was a serial killer, and he went to lengths to be sure they never knew. They were two of the very few people in his life he ever truly cared about, and he certainly did not want to disappoint them. They were taken from him in a car accident when Ski Mask was still a young man in his early 20s. Psychologists would pinpoint that incident in Ski Mask's life as the beginning of his murderous tendencies, had that been when his killing spree began. But alas, he was nearing a decade into his hobby by that point. Family History of Mental Disorders It's not uncommon for serial killers' families to have a history of mental illness and criminal behavior. None of Ski Mask's relatives had any such history. He comes from a lineage of hard-working and respected people. Growing up isolated. Many serial killers have no meaningful relationships as they grow up and often end up as loners with no close friends. Many were frequently bullied and labeled as outcasts as children. Growing up, Ski Mask functioned normally in society. During his school days, he had friends, girlfriends, played sports, and attended school-related social gatherings. All of the things one would expect out of a normal young man. It is true that as he grew older and became more experienced at his hobby, Ski Mask did become more of a loner, but not for the reasons that would be typical of a serial killer. For one thing, it became necessary to shut others out for legality reasons, Killing is illegal, after all, and part of the thrill for Ski Mask is getting away with it. The less people he interacts with, the less likely anyone would suspect him of wrongdoing. But more so, the need for others was no longer necessary. Killing became his friend. Back in school, having friends helped to break the monotony of the prison-like regime. Once he discovered his love for killing, he didn't need them anymore and gradually discarded them. As he aged and spent more of his time killing, he increasingly grew to dislike and even be disgusted by people in general, viewing most of them as sheep that blindly conform to what is expected of them. To Ski Mask, most are mere pawns within the game he plays. Cruelty to Animals Most serial killers have a cruelty to animals phase. Nothing could be farther from the truth regarding Ski Mask. Quite the contrary, as he cared deeply for all of the pets his family ever had. Arson Arson sometimes gives serial killers a satisfying sense of control. This is something that has never even crossed Ski Mask's mind. Sexual deviance and or sexual inadequacies. These are often primary motives for serial killing. This is a factor that has absolutely nothing to do with Ski Mask's interest. Before killing consumed his life, he had girlfriends and got laid. Like most adolescent boys, he was curious, experimented, but never viewed it as anything more than a little fun. Ski Mask sometimes uses a sexual angle with women to make them feel uncomfortable or to get a reaction out of them, but it has nothing to do with sexual desire. That's more about power and control. Substance Abuse Numerous serial killers have an extensive history of substance abuse. Many are under the influence when they commit their acts. Ski Mask has never taken any drugs or had a drop of alcohol in his entire life. Voyeurism some serial killers partake in voyeurism for a sense of control and a way of exerting power over unsuspecting victims. Ski Mask would consider that pitiful. 
Why obsess over someone else's life when you have control over your own? It simply doesn't compute. It's also a test of his patience. The best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. Adaption is a necessity. And there's an entire after-kill process. Ski Mask wasn't aware that the exposure to his father's profession would come so in handy for him later in life. And of course, there's the adrenaline rush that comes from the excitement, power, fulfillment, and discipline, all culminating into that final satisfaction of conquest. It's not just the thrill of the kill. It's the thrill of the hunt. Ski Mask is a monster. Chapter 5 Awakening Ski Mask's eyes open. The hallway seems brighter. He turns his head to the right to see the intense wall of light calling to him. He turns his head to the left and sees a change. Darkness has been replaced by two lit ovals. They're different than the all-encompassing wall of light, though. They're not as bright, and there appears to be something beyond them. Some kind of movement. These are windows. A man in a white doctor's jacket is moving around a room. It's a laboratory of some kind. Ski masks can make out steel gurneys, counters with test tubes, beakers, microscopes, multiple computers, and glass cabinets filled with various medical supplies. These are my eyes! The man finally stops moving and turns toward the eye windows. It's him! It's that son of a bitch who hit me with his car! Suddenly, Ski Mask feels like he is being swept up in a tidal wave and flies completely out of control toward the eye windows. Darkness. Ski Mask gently opens his eyes. He is inside the laboratory now. The long-faced man is standing in front of him, staring at him. He moves in closer and tilts his head slightly to the right and then to the left as he looks more intently at Ski Mask. The long-faced man takes an ophthalmoscope out of his jacket pocket and holds it up to Ski Mask's eyes. After looking at each eye for several seconds, he steps back and looks past Ski Mask. Okay, he's here. Not all the way back yet, but he's here. The long-faced man gives Ski Mask one long last look before walking to a nearby gurney. Sitting on the gurney is the dachshund. He is staring directly at Ski Mask and wagging his thin tail. He stands up on the table and gives a playful bark. Ski Mask can see another man enter his frame of vision. He's roughly the same height as the long-faced man, but much older, late 70s, maybe early 80s. He's thin, bald, and wears wire-framed spectacles. Run the process on Subject M again. The long-faced man fills a syringe from a medicine bottle and walks over to the dachshund. The friendly dog continues to stare at Ski Mask and wag his tail. He never even whimpers as the long-faced man injects him. Very quickly, the dog's tail slows down and stops. His eyes close and he slumps over. Ski Mask's temper begins to rise. He tries to leap forward, but he can't move. His breathing quickens, and he can now feel his chest rising as it fills with oxygen. The long-faced man holds a stethoscope to the dog's chest. He listens in multiple areas and then looks up at the old man. He's gone. Bring him back. The long-faced man takes a small device out of his pocket. It looks similar to a flash drive. He presses a button on the device which illuminates the tip in a red glow. The old man softly speaks into a slim digital recorder. This will be the fifth renewal of Subject M. The long-faced man holds the glowing tip to the base of the dog's skull. Within seconds, that thin, hard tail begins wagging, and the dog rises up. He immediately looks at Ski Mask and lets out a playful yip. Kill him again! Ski Mask can feel his skin burning with fury. 
A tingling begins in his fingertips, followed by a powerful shock shooting through his entire body. The long-faced man fills the syringe with fluid again and steps over to the dog. Schemas tries to spring forward. This time he can feel himself move slightly and then abruptly stop, accompanied by a loud metallic rattle. He looks at his wrist to see that he is being restrained by thick leather straps. He notices that he is fastened to a large metal table that has been rotated into an upright position. Whoever tied his straps didn't know what they were doing and left a lot of slack, allowing Ski Mask to muster a good amount of force as he vigorously thrusts both of his hands forward in rapid repetition. A thunderous rattle of metal noticeably startles both men. Holy shit! Ski Mask can feel the restraint on his right wrist starting to give way. He consolidates all of his energy into one last powerful yank, which successfully breaks the restraint. Oh my god, he's loose! The men duck for cover as Ski Mask uses his free hand to swiftly undo the remaining restraint. The room begins to echo with the yipping of the dachshund who seems to be cheering Ski Mask on. Ski Mask turns toward the long-faced man who stumbles backwards in a panic, sending several test tubes crashing onto the floor. Before Ski Mask can take a step forward, he feels a crash against his head. He turns to see the wide-eyed old man holding a thin metal tray. Ski Mask stares coldly at the terrified old man whose breathing has become short and rapid. Clearly the old man thought the tray would do more damage, but it did accomplish one thing. Time for the long-faced man to pull out a gun. Freeze! Ski Mask turns to see the long-faced man pointing a revolver at him. Don't move or I'll shoot! Ski Mask glares at the long-faced man with a burning rage. Please, we, we don't want to kill you again. The old man shoots a glance at the long-faced man as if he shouldn't have said that. Ski Mask ponders the statement for a few seconds before speaking. Consider this your lucky day. Instead of decorating this room with your intestines, I'm just going to leave. Ski Mask begins to turn and then stops. Oh, and I'm taking this dog with me. He picks up the dachshund and turns for the door. Uh, no! Uh, uh, freeze! Stop! Ski Mask turns around slowly and glares at the long-faced man. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm truly sorry, but we, we, we can't just let you go. If you want to shoot, go right ahead. But you better hit the mark or else I'm going to come over there and show you what pain really is. The old man steps forward. Let him go. The long-faced man looks perplexed. But we can't. I said let him go. Sweat drips down the long-faced man's brow as he takes in a deep, choppy breath and lowers the gun. Ski Mask gives them both one last scowl, turns, and exits the building. Chapter 6 In Aeternum what just happened? Ski Mask walks to the quiet road in front of him and then turns to see exactly where he was. It's an old two-story brick house. The first floor windows are boarded up, but rays of light penetrate the imperfections in the wood. The second floor's windows appear to be intact but reveal only blackness behind them. We don't want to kill you again. Is that what he said? Again? What the hell did that mean? He feels the whip tail of the dachshund slapping against his body. He looks down at the short-haired, weasel-bodied dog that he is holding and is greeted by cheerful eyes and an excited whimper. Hang on, I'm gonna get us out of here. He looks around the bleak area. There are a few similar old homes scattered on the road. Most have an appearance of disrepair. All look abandoned. Based on the surrounding chatter, crickets and other night insects are making the most of the structures. He walks closer to the street corner to look at the intersection's street signs. The good news is, he recognizes the street names. The bad news is, he's about 20 miles from where his truck is parked. Ski Mask makes a mental note of the location. The entire situation needs revisiting. But first, 
he has to get his bearings. He pulls out his cell phone and notices a missed call from Tamale Jones. It's probably nothing urgent. He's likely calling about some jobs. Tamale is a legitimate private detective who often calls Ski Mask when he needs some muscle. Tamale is also the private detective who other PIs call when they need something done off the books, meaning illegal. Some of these underground type jobs include intimidation, roughing someone up, or even making somebody disappear. These are Ski Mask's specialties, and he doesn't come cheap. Getting paid to do what you love, that's the life. He's about to call Tamale to come get him when he notices a woman standing under a street light on the corner. She's wearing a tight, short black skirt, over-the-knee boots, and a snug pink sweater. The street light highlights her shoulder-length platinum hair. When it becomes clear that Ski Mask has seen her, she gets into an old car and drives off. Was she watching him? Ski Mask's thoughts are interrupted when he notices a minor discomfort and itchiness coming from his upper right arm. He reaches under his shirt and feels a warm spot on his arm, like a burn. A burn? He stops in his tracks and holds out his hands. Not a scratch. He runs his hands over his face and head and notices nothing unusual. And most peculiar of all, he is not sore. If he remembers correctly, he was hit by a car earlier, and the only pain he feels is a slight ache coming from the burn on his upper arm region. What the hell is going on? Beams of headlights emerge from behind Ski Mask and his canine companion. A large Mercedes comes to a halt next to him, and the buzz of the passenger side window can be heard as it lowers. Ski Mask bends down to see a man in his fifties with salt and pepper flowing hair and dressed in a tuxedo. The man speaks with an Australian accent. Is that a dachshund you're holding? Ski Mask acknowledges the man's question with a nod. I love dachshunds. Where you headed? Downtown. Hop in, I'll give you a ride. Ski Mask doesn't hesitate. The Mercedes begins peeling off as Ski Mask shuts the door. My name's Stuart. Stuart keeps looking over at the little dachshund as he drives, smiling and occasionally reaching over to rub on him a bit. Hey, he reminds me of a dog we used to have back in Australia, except my little guy had a white chest. His name was Tim Tam. Ah, oh, he was such a great dog. He was always so happy and playful. We had a pet door so he can go in and out as he pleased. Whenever he'd come back in, he'd hop around like a little kangaroo for three or four seconds. Every time. It was the craziest thing. Oh, then this one time I noticed he came back inside and didn't hop around like he always did. He just walked in real slow-like, sat down and stared up at the ceiling. I noticed he was frothing at the mouth. I was concerned. I, I thought maybe he had gotten rabies or something, so I, I took him to the local veterinarian. You'll never guess what was wrong with him. He was intoxicated. See, in Australia we have these big fat things called cane toads, and they're poisonous. If a dog licks the toad, the poison can act as an hallucinogen. So when Tim Tam would find one, he'd lick it, just enough to get high. Sometimes if he'd lick them too much, he'd get sick, so over time, he figured out just how much to lick them to get intoxicated without falling ill. Crazy dog. He lived a nice long life, though. I miss that boy. What's your dog's name? Ski Mask thinks for a moment before answering. Subject M. Subject M? Well, kudos to you for the originality, but sorry to say, that's a shit name for a dog. Ski Mask nods in agreement. As they enter a more populated area, Stuart points to a mid-sized building. There is no name on the exterior, but it appears to be a business. The fluorescent lights of the lobby can be seen through the glass doors of the main entrance. I have to run in here and talk to someone, mate. Shouldn't be but a few minutes. Stuart pulls over, quickly exits the vehicle, and disappears into the building. While he waits, Ski Mask turns his attention back to the dachshund. This will be the fifth renewal for Subject M. Renewal? What were they doing to you? 
Ski Mask inspects the dachshund's head and neck area for any noticeable wounds, but he looks unscathed. He's right. Subject M is a shit name. What should we call you? Ski Mask thinks for a moment. How about we call you... Max. The wiry dog wags his tail more vigorously as if approving of the upgraded name. He whimpers slightly and begins to pant. I bet you're thirsty, aren't you? I know I am. Ski Mask eyes the building Stuart entered. Come on. Ski Mask enters the lobby of the building with Max under his arm. The lobby is vanilla, both in color and feeling. There is a small unisex bathroom door near the entrance that he steps toward, but then stops when he notices something very out of place in this plain lobby. A mammoth rustic wooden door. Something one might expect to see at the entrance of a castle. The words in eternum are handwritten on the wall next to the door. Ski Mask takes in the unusual sight for a moment and then heads into the bathroom. This room, as expected, is small, modern, and plain. He turns on the sink, bends down, and takes a couple large gulps for himself. He then cups his hands and fills them with sink water for Max, who quickly laps it up. As he enters the bathroom, he sees a woman outside looking in through the glass doors. It's the same platinum-haired, tight-skirted gal with the pink top who was watching him earlier. When she spots Ski Mask, she swiftly walks away. Ski Mask bolts toward the door to catch her and find out who she is, but stops when he hears a deep voice behind him. May I help you? Ski Mask turns to see a black cloaked figure standing in front of the wooden door. He can barely make out the pale face veiled within the hood. I'm waiting for Stuart. The cloaked figure stares at him for a moment, turns, opens the wooden door just enough to enter, and shuts it behind him. Ski Mask notices that the door didn't properly latch behind the cloaked man and is slightly ajar. His curiosity gets the better of him, and he walks forward to inspect further. It's open only a few inches, just enough for Ski Mask to see a stone wall. He reaches out and slowly opens the door, revealing a long stone corridor. Amber light dances off the stone from lit torches lining the wall. The cobblestone floor disappears as it winds around a bend, and he can hear the reverbing sound of voices coming from beyond his sight. He decides to investigate as to where the mysterious corridor leads, but before he can take a step, Stuart rounds the bend with a short, stout, silver-haired woman by his side. Oh, there ya! Stuart smiles as he and his female companion make their way up the corridor toward him. The woman holds an emotionless expression, but does seem to be taking interest in Ski Mask as they approach. I do apologize for taking longer than I meant to. This is Mona. Mona stares at Ski Mask for a few seconds before reaching out and touching his free hand. She immediately recoils and speaks in a shocked whisper. The Reaper. Her eyes widen and she covers her mouth with her hand. Stuart's smile disappears and he takes in a deep breath. He looks back and forth between Ski Mask and Mona a few times before quickly collecting himself and breaking the odd moment. He smiles, puts his hand on Ski Mask's shoulder, and gently turns him back toward the door. Come on, mate. Let's get you to your vehicle. Chapter 7 The Whore The street lights grow in abundance and the interior of the vehicle illuminates as Stuart and Ski Mask get closer to the downtown region. Stuart smiles and looks at Ski Mask. I'm sorry, I never even asked you what your name is, did I? No, you didn't. Stuart waits a few seconds expecting to hear a name, but respects Ski Mask's choice and continues on. Well, we're almost there, mate. I hope you and Subject M have a beauty of a night. Max. I'm sorry? I took your advice and renamed him. His new name is Max. Stuart nods and lets out a little laugh. 
Max. That's one hell of an improvement over Subject M. Congratulations. Stewart pulls over behind Ski Mask's pickup truck. Here ya. As the vehicle stops, Ski Mask gets out and crosses over to his vehicle. Stewart follows. Listen, mate, I suppose you're wondering what all that was back there? Sure, but it's none of my business, so no explanation necessary. Thanks for the lift. It was my pleasure, and I think we might just meet again one day. He smiles at Ski Mask and looks down at Max and gives him a gentle pat on the head. Good on you, mate. Ski Mask sits down in his pickup truck and sets Max in the passenger seat. He pulls out his cell phone and scrolls through a few contacts on his list. He stops on the name Claire. Before selecting her to be dialed, he glances into his side view mirror and sees the platinum haired woman again. She's standing outside the entrance to a bar, watching him. Ski Mask immediately gets out of the truck, causing the startled platinum haired girl to hurry into the bar. Ski Mask is about to fly after her when he hears Max let out a whiny bark. He looks at Max through the window. I'll be right back. Max jumps into the driver's seat and stares at Ski Mask with sad eyes and begins to cry. Shit. Ski Mask opens the door, tucks Max under his arm, and then hurries into the bar. Ski Mask takes a quick scan around the small packed pub, but doesn't see the platinum-haired woman. The bartender spots Ski Mask with Max. Hey, no dogs allowed in here! Ski Mask gives the bartender a stare that makes the bartender regret saying anything. Did you say something? The bartender shakes his head and places his view elsewhere. Ski Mask walks briskly through the bar, scanning as he goes, but doesn't catch sight of her. He reaches a small hallway with men's and women's bathrooms on either side. He tries the women's room, but it's locked. He kicks it open. It's a tiny bathroom with one toilet, which is being used. Hey! It's not her. He turns and opens the men's room door, only to be greeted by a man taking a piss. Uh, it's crowded in here, buddy. Ski Mask peers down the hall and sees a shabby door with an exit sign above it. He hurries out the door and steps into a well-lit, clean brick alley. He looks both ways, but it's vacant. He lets out a disappointed breath and is about to turn to go back through the bar when he notices a black boot barely peeking out from a small nook leading into the back entrance of a neighboring establishment. He wastes no time in bolting to the nook and pulling out the platinum-haired girl. He forcefully shoves her against the alley wall. Max's whip tail beats against his side as Ski Mask wraps his free hand around the woman's throat. Who are you? He loosens his grasp enough so that she can speak. Hey, I'm just looking for a date. A date? So you're just some slut? I'm not a slut. I'm a working girl. Slut, whore, what's the difference? Sluts give it away for free. You gotta pay to play with me. Ski Mask looks at her with repulsion. I bet a lot of guys have been inside you tonight, haven't they? Enough to pay the rent. Why don't you let me go, honey, and move along? You're bad for business. Ski Mask looks at her closely and takes in a deep sniff. You don't smell like a whore. And just what does a whore smell like? Sweat and scum sloppily concealed with cheap perfume. You're no whore. He squeezes a little tighter. Now tell me who you are. You can call me Platinum. That's your name? Platinum? That's what you can call me. Ski Mask smirks and lightens his grip. Who do you work for? Platinum doesn't speak, but Ski Mask can see the wheels in her mind turning, as if trying to find the words to explain to him. He decides to hurry things along. You work for them, don't you? Them? The old man and the long-faced, wild-haired guy. Platinum smiles. You should talk to them. You might be interested in what they have to say. Ski Mask studies her for a moment. Max lets out a short, playful bark that makes Ski Mask break his gaze from the whore and look down at him. The sight of the happy dog causes Ski Mask to relax a bit. He lets out a breath, releases his grip on platinum, and walks away. As Ski Mask drives, he takes out his cell phone, scrolls down to the name Claire, and dials. Hi, it's me. I know, you wouldn't believe the night I've had. How's Madeline doing? Did she take her medicine? Good, good. 
Oh, yeah. I think we may have a new addition to the family. You'll see. I'll be home before long. I just have one more stop to make. With Max under his arm, Ski Mask walks deliberately up to the tattered old building that he was captive in earlier and walks through the door. The long-faced man's jaw drops when he sees Ski Mask. He quickly fumbles around for the gun which is sitting on a nearby gurney. Don't bother. If I wanted to kill you, you'd be dead already. The old man smiles. I told you he'd be back. The long-faced man gulps and sets down the gun. The old man looks at Ski Mask and speaks calmly. Please have a seat. Make yourself comfortable. We have some explaining to do. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Alfred Grimm. He motions to the long-faced man. This is my son, Franklin. Franklin gives Ski Mask a grin and piques Ski Mask's curiosity when he speaks. Welcome to your second life. The End The Nine Lives of Ski Mask continues with Life 2, Ski Mask's Lair.